Coming up on Influencing Entrepreneurs. It was in my 10th year, there was an accounting year. And the question became, you know, whether I knew about it. Probably three months afterward, when uh, my attorneys notified me that uh, the, the SEC and the U.S. Department of Justice are going to be looking into this, you know, and buckle up, you better lawyer up. This season of Influencing Entrepreneurs is brought to you by the Entrepreneurs Organization of Charlotte and Spiracle Media. After years of teaching entrepreneurship and consulting business owners, I realized that true knowledge comes from the wins and losses of those entrepreneurs. These are the stories of those business leaders. I'm Casmer Ward, and this is Influencing Entrepreneurs. We're here today with Jeff Conway, owner of four Ruth Chris Steakhouses and the creator and owner of Napa on Providence. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. So in our previous conversation, I got to be honest, you have a story that I would love to make a, you know, a made for television miniseries because you've had so much, honestly, uh, excitement, adventure, uh, maybe turmoil. And it just is really a journey. And, you know, knowing what a great guy you are, it just it it didn't break you. We're both accountants by trade, so I, I always love to point that out. We don't get too many exciting accountants in this yeah, yeah. Uh, in our interview. But let's talk a little bit about your early um, your early roles as a chief financial officer, playing that entrepreneurship role to build a company. Well, so I started. I had ten years in public accounting first with Coopers and Librand, and then Ernst and Young, and then I had an opportunity. Uh, one of my clients wanted to hire me and I uh, got involved with a, a company called Rentway. I put the deal together with some wealthy uh, New York financiers and uh, we bought a troubled rent-to-own company, about 17 stores, and then we grew that to 1,100 stores, all company-owned, went through the process of taking the company public and uh, you know, three times in the Fortune 100 fastest growing companies. but. 17 to 1100 stores was pretty dynamic growth that took place over 10 years and over the course of that 10 years let's even talk about year zero right before you even start that um the rent to own is this is it just the opportunity presented itself to you i, I had a client in the industry mm -hmm. and i saw that uh, there was there was an opportunity to roll up mm -hmm. to a because the industry was undercapitalized it was financed principally by Transamerica out of, out of San Francisco. So I got together with another one of my clients and, and uh, they, had, they had said, Jeff, we think you're a bright guy. You ever find a good business opportunity, bring it to our attention. So I said, hey, I got this idea. I pitched them on it. They said, yeah, let's, let's try this. We bought a company called Rentway and then we ended up taking it public and growing it from that point. I'm assuming taking it public didn't happen overnight. What were some of those first few years like to, to figure it out to where you could get it to public? Well, this was a unique transaction. My partner was the vice chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, and he had a small securities firm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea was to get a, a small public company with a stock that's trading and to use that as a relatively cheap currency to acquire other rent to own operations. It was hard. It took a couple of years with all the SEC filings you have to make. And that I, you know, I knew how to do that. It took about two years to actually get the company public. Um, and then we started growing like very quickly. So as the acquisitions go, what kind of growing pains, what kind of, uh, what kind of changes are you going through? Okay. So one of the real challenges here was, you know, I'm, I was a, strong accountant, you know, but was in the audit department for 10 years, had a lot of large clients. But when you, the first uh, investment we made was in a 17 store chain. And then, then the next acquisition we had lined up was, uh, it took us to about 40 stores. So we doubled and we started doubling every year. Well, when, when you're doubling in size, think your accounting systems, your capitalization, your the, your staffing, right. uh, huge issues on top of merger integration issues. So even all those small little problems, they become exponentially larger. Yeah, think think of it. You know, one one day we had seventeen rental stores. Right. You close the acquisition. Now you got forty, and then a year later you have eighty, 
And then a year later, you have 160 and then 400 and then 800. Lots of challenges in that process. At 10 years, after 10 years, how, how large is the company? The company uh, got to 1,100 stores, about 5,000 employees, market cap close to a billion dollars, from a $7 million IPO to a billion dollar market cap. All the success, you probably, probably more than you even bargained for at that point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was on the, I say I rang the ballot in, on the New York Stock Exchange. It's a podium yeah. and it's a buzzer. And I was with a group of people. Um, I, I viewed that as a, a major achievement to go from such a small publicly held company to a, a New York Stock Exchange listed company. So what happens next after that? It was in my 10th year, there was an accounting year. And the question became, you know, whether I knew about it. As soon as I found about the year, I reported it to the CEO. I was president and chief operating officer mm -hmm. at that point. The first eight years, I was the chief financial officer. Then I got promoted to president, chief operating officer. And my life changed like that. You could almost call it a, a VUCA moment, you know, vulnerability, uncertainty, chaos, adversity. And this was about the time that Enron was going on. And so, um, you know, immediately the question became whether Jeff Conway knew about the error, the accounting error, or had anything to do with it. And, and without getting too technical, the error. It was an understatement of depreciation. Understatement of depreciation. Right. right. You mentioned there's there's questions whether it was intentional or not. Based on everything you're saying, it, it just was an error, an well, oversight. I, no, someone yeah. made a fraudulent accounting entry. Someone and did make, okay. After when the investigation uh, started going, there, there was... At, at the root of it was a fraudulent accounting entry. When you notify the CEO that there is this error, what is that gap that turns it into an investigation? First, I was about two weeks to stay out of the office. Right. They did the investigation, then they asked me to assist with it. The investigation wrapped up in a couple of months. I was exonerated and cleared. And uh, the board did say that you know the accounting error occurred on my watch. So I was asked to resign. I resigned. And because of my success, there were there were companies, private equity firms out there that wanted to hire me. So life, you know, went on. But but then the Securities Exchange Commission decided to investigate in a in a fairly zealous U.S. attorney. So so really, the investigation clears your name. Yeah. You you're asked to step down from your role. You move on to put it all behind you, and then the SEC just brings it right back. Right. And I was a board member of Rentway and I had directors and officers insurance. So, I, you know, it was probably three months afterward when uh, my attorneys notified me that uh, the, the SEC and the U.S. Department of Justice are going to be looking into this, you know, and buckle up. You better lawyer up. Did it feel the same as the investigation or did the weight of it feel a whole lot heavier? Uh, that's serious. You know, the, when a U.S. attorney comes after you, um, that's, that's not a good feeling. Um, you know, and basically they told my, I was represented by Jones Day, it's the largest law firm in the country. You know, they just said, don't say anything. Right. So I didn't say anything. Uh, I was hired right about that time by Ruth Chris to come in as the CFO of Ruth Chris Steakhouse. So I, I kind of compartmentalized everything and move forward with my life and let the investigation run its course. You're lawyered up. You've got a, 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 a prestigious law firm telling you to say nothing. Do you do you feel confident at this point? I'm the kind of person that that I felt bad. I, I put the deal together for this company. I at I became kind of the heart and soul of the company in many ways as as we grew from such a small it's kind of investment. Baby. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our our investment originally for a third of the company was $100,000. That was at 13 cents a share. The stock went to $35 a share. Yeah. Okay. That and you know I had gotten hundreds of thousands of stock options along the way and right. so yeah, I mean, I, it was a big deal. Right. Um but you, but you feel confident as far as your representation like Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although there's always once you get sued at this type of level, there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, is, did I have an email? Should I have known about this? In my case, the question became, did Jeff know about it? Did he direct anyone to make an accounting error? Right. 
Uh, did I look the other way? Everything you're saying, it doesn't sound like there was any malfeasance. There was not even any uh, negligence. To help kind of wrap this up, so it took about four years of investigation. You know, I moved on with my career at at uh, Ruth's Chris, mm -hmm. um, and there, you know, there are lots of lots of depositions and uh, lots, lots of legal fees. <laughs> yeah, but I had directors and officers okay. insurance. I had three attorneys billing six hundred dollars an hour for three years. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, and then they kind of exhausted the DNO insurance and things started to settle pretty quickly. And the end result was the U.S. Attorney's Office felt that I had looked the other way. They, they came to my attorneys and said, look, he's a really good guy, but we think he willingly uh, was deliberately blind and willfully ignorant. And, and that gets real political when, when it becomes a high profile case like this. My prosecutor was Mary Beth Buchanan. She had political aspirations and uh, was making an example of me. And she made an example of, of you and Tommy, Tommy Chong. Chong. You can Google Chong. her, Mary Beth Buchanan. Right. Yes. Uh, he, he ended up uh, going to prison for 10 months, just like me. So you end up getting convicted and... Uh, well, they, so they, they come to you and say, we think you look the other way. Okay. Either you accept our deal, which, is, which was conspiracy to commit a books and records violation. So not even fraud, they, right. they say. They say, but you conspired, and I and I could say, well, I knew we were fairly aggressive on how we accrued utilities at your end. Right. I went to more of a cash basis for accruing utilities right. instead of actually accruing all the utilities. Right. We had 1,100 units, but when you're running a public company, you're very sensitive to the the Wall Street right. forecasts and the whisper number and. You know, we had a culture in the company that was very focused on meeting the street's expectations. And with the dynamic growth that we had, um, I, our systems became overwhelmed at one point and reports didn't look the same. And for you're, you're a little bit younger than me, but ERP implementations uh, in the 90s were, were not near as sophisticated as they are now. So uh, one of the things that happened is our, our PeopleSoft implementation didn't go well. There was a data collision uh, company. I was president, chief operating officer at this point. Uh, so anyway, to make a, a long story short, the question became whether Jeff had looked the other way. After three years of investigation and then some time period, they said, that's, they said Jeff didn't make any Counting entries didn't tell anyone to do it, um, but he looked the other way. He should have known. And so they, uh, they, they made my attorneys an offer, which they communicated to me. They said, we'll offer him a conspiracy to commit a books and records violation. If he doesn't, if he doesn't take that deal, if we convict him of even one count of fraud, he would do 25 years without parole. And at that point, you make the decision to take the deal. I have a, you know, I got married in 1978 and I've got a lovely wife and three great kids and I just fight, taking that fight on, it was not worth the risk. So we make the decision to plea, then they dollarize the uh, damages. They came up that, they came up with a crazy calculation that I had sold some stock, a very small amount of stock and avoided a loss of $82,000 which uh, was significant enough to be a felony. And in a felony, there, there was, uh, they do a points calculation. This is back when they had mandatory minimums. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, it was, the judge has discretion, right? I ended up getting a 13 month sentence in prison. I ended up serving 306 days in prison. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for part two of this episode. Influencing Entrepreneurs is brought to you by the Entrepreneurs Organization of Charlotte and Spherical Media. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash or visit casmerward.com.